Good morning, bird brains, and welcome to story time. I have almost zero photos or videos of this story, so sit back and let my storyboard of stock photos and blurry cell phone pictures take you on a journey. As most of you have heard already, last month we brought our little baby girl into the world, but she didn't come easy. Here's the story of her early, lengthy, problem-stricken 55-hour delivery. Let's get into it. We set off to our OBGYN for our regularly scheduled appointment, just as we had every two weeks or so for the past couple of months. The mood was light, but with a slight level of concern. The previous week, Miss Bird had gone in and had some blood work done after complaining about some itchy feet during the evening. The doctor had warned us that itchy feet, particularly in the evening, can be a side effect of cholestasis. What is cholestasis, you might ask? In short, it's when the mother's liver stops working as designed, causing bile to overflow into the bloodstream, which can be bad for the baby. Although common, it can cause some serious issues for the birth. Hashtag foreshadowing. I sat in my truck, not by choice, but rather because of COVID regulations, and waited for Miss Bird to return. She returned with a nervous grin on her face. After she climbed into the truck, she murmured, we need to go to the hospital, still with this nervous smirk on her face. She then informed me that our regular doctor was out on vacation, but the reserve doctor had taken a look at the results and said that he calmly insisted that we go to the hospital to induce labor. It wasn't what you'd call an emergency delivery. With Miss Bird being just shy of 38 weeks, it was more of a case of we have a higher chance of something going wrong if we wait for natural labor than if we induce and speed the process up a bit. He also mentioned that he didn't expect her to be delivered until late Sunday. I thought he had clearly forgotten what day it was, but boy was I wrong. We stopped by her house to grab our hospital bags and we set out towards the hospital. We arrive at the hospital, have our temperatures checked at the front entrance, and then make our way up to the second floor where the labor and delivery ward is. When we go to check in, the lady at the front desk lets us know that they haven't received orders from the doctor just yet and that there weren't any clean rooms, which was a weird thought I hadn't had before. The fact that the bed your wife is about to bring your child into the world on has also been the bed that many a mothers have done the exact same thing on. Kind of beautiful if you think about it, but also... Yeah. About an hour passes and they call us back to a room. We start unpacking and getting settled in. The head nurse comes in and informs us they have to perform a COVID test on mom as part of protocol. She brain ah. her skull with a Q-tip and leaves the room. About 30 to 45 minutes go by and a different nurse comes in wearing full protective gear. The test came back positive. This came to quite a shock as we had been super careful throughout the whole pregnancy, but the nurse assured us that the delivery doesn't change much at all. The biggest change from a normal delivery is that I wasn't able to leave the room and that we would only have one nurse assigned to us. Seemed reasonable at the time. After a figurative labyrinth of medical questioning, they started to administer a drug through IV to start the birthing process. Keep in mind, she isn't dilated, her water hasn't broke, nothing. We're literally starting from step one here. Within a couple of hours, Alicia starts to have pretty regular contractions. Very painful contractions according to her. Enough to make her scrum around in the bed making all sorts of god-awful noises. In my head I'm thinking, this has to be a good thing, right? We've got to be making some progress. We both try to get some rest through the night, but neither of us are successful. That notoriously uncomfortable dad chair combined with my broken back and pregnant Godzilla right next to me proved nearly impossible to sleep. We had hit the 12 hour mark since they had begun administering the labor meds, so it was time for a checkup. The nurse rolls up her sleeve and goes elbow deep. She feels around a bit while Alicia looks like she wants to murder her. She pulls her arm out and informs us that she is still at zero centimeters. No progress. After 12 hours of agony, we were still at step one. Alicia, however, had already hit her pain tolerance and wanted an epidural ASAP, so they set up that procedure with the anesthesiologist on call at the time. Now this guy, what a peach. Middle-aged white guy walks in with all of his supplies. You can tell by his body language that he wasn't in the best of moods. Just the guy you want to stab a needle into your spine, right? Anyways, I listen to him talking to the nurses and I figure out the case of him being Mr. Grumpy Gills is that the clocks in his wing of the hospital weren't set back and that he wasn't informed that our room was a COVID room. This was shortly after daylight savings time. So we had to use his watch to see the real time and had to wash his hands when he leaves our room. I'm truly flabbergasted at how this man made it through the day. After three, 
yes, three attempts at stabbing my wife in the back with what I can only describe as the ink tube out of a Bic pen, the epidural was in and they started giving her the good stuff. The contractions continued, but the pain was far more manageable. It was at this point they decided to try a more effective labor-inducing medication through the IV. This caused the contractions to be a bit more powerful, but were still manageable with the epidural. Another 12 hours had passed. The epidural's effectiveness had waned and the pain was back in close to full effect. Our nurse came in and said she was going to check Alicia's progress. After 24 hours of contractions, we had made it to two centimeters. The doctor came in to discuss options with us. We all felt it would be best to pause the labor inducing meds, continue with the pain meds, and let her body rest throughout the night and get back to work come 4 a.m. the following morning. We were both excited for this as we were in desperate need of some sleep. Sun rose to our third day within the same room. Neither of us had smelled fresh air, felt the sun on our skin, or heard the road rage honks coming from all across the city that we're all so familiar with. The medical professionals began administering the labor meds a few hours prior. On a positive note, all of them had a hopeful attitude that today was going to be the day. Mama made it clear to little Luna that she had overstayed her welcome and that she needed to vacate the premises at her earliest convenience. Over the next few hours, nothing really exciting happened. The contractions continued at a nice regular pace, but we weren't making any real progress in terms of dilation. Alicia had been experiencing some pretty bad pain for an hour or so before she wet the bed. And by wet the bed, I mean her water broke. She was still only at two centimeters, but the nurses explained that was expected after such a long break from the meds the night before. The anesthesiologist, a very nice female doctor now, not Mr. Grumpy Gills, came in and switched up her meds that seemed to really do the trick to get rid of the pain. They also explained to us that the next 12 hours were likely to be crunch time. They said that with an induced labor, the time spent between 0 and 5 centimeters was always the longest. I must say, they knew what they were talking about. By 2.30 p.m., she had doubled to 4 centimeters, and the nurse placed an internal monitor in order to better monitor the strength and frequency of the contractions to better administer the meds. The pain since the 4 centimeter milestone had steadily increased and now had reached a point that the anesthesiologist made the call that the epidural needed to be replaced. She explained that it's a very common thing for labors that last this long and would be absolutely necessary if this birth were to go to C-section. So being the trooper that she is, Miss Bird said, F*** it, and let them stab her in the spine with a coffee stirrer once more. Meanwhile, one of the hardest parts for me was not being able to leave the room. I had to damn near beg just to get some drinking water. Thankfully, we packed plenty of snacks in our hospital bags or I'm almost certain a rib would have poked through. All the while, COVID symptoms had started creeping their way into both of us. I couldn't smell or taste a thing. Alicia could taste, but she couldn't smell. Her temperature was a bit high in the mid 99s, but hadn't reached fever level. And none of the doctors or nurses were concerned about it. Doc came in and checked her progress once more, but we'd only hit the five centimeter mark. She informed us that given the amount of time she'd been in labor, plus the amount of time that had passed since her water had broken, that she was going to give her one more hour to see substantial progress, or she was going to highly recommend a C-section. We had discussed this as a couple months ago, so the decision was easy. We were going to give natural birth as good of a shot as we could, but as soon as a doctor recommended a C-section for safety reasons, we would of course listen to the medical professionals. Something that I thought was common sense prior to 2020. It was decision making time. An hour had passed since her last check. Given the previous check-ins, we weren't in high hopes that she would have made any substantial progress in the last 60 minutes. The doctor rolled up her sleeve, Tiger woods her way in there, and immediately had a look of shock. She had made it to 8 centimeters. Finally, a bit of good news. She said that she was comfortable letting this go on naturally for the time being, and said to expect about a centimeter an hour for the next two hours, and that's exactly what happened. The clock ticked over to another day just before it was time to start pushing. She had reached 10 centimeters and things were starting to happen. The lead nurse was in there ready to deliver. She said that she could feel the full 10 centimeters and that she could feel our baby's head and that it was covered in hair. After thoroughly explaining the pushing process, the work began. Now the next hour flew by for me, but I'm sure it wasn't the same experience from the bed. Even though time was flying, the work, the dedication, the heart that she was putting into this birth wasn't lost on anyone in the room. I'll admit that I give my wife a pretty hard time for being a weenie quite often. 
But let me make it very clear, when I say she took off that Weenie Hut Jr. hat and stepped right into the Salty Spittoon without even looking at the bouncer. For a full hour, she did exactly as the nurse asked, pushing as hard as she could for as long as she could. With each breath, her face mask getting sucked into her mouth. It looked downright torturous from my end. After a grueling 60 minute stint, the nurse made the call that her body just didn't have enough energy to give birth. Completely understandable after what she'd just been through over the last few days. We agreed with the call to move to a C-section and things moved very quickly after that. I'd say within 30 minutes or so, they wheeled her out of the room to get her over to surgery prep. I had to wait in the room for the time being. Time seemed to slow down in those next moments. I believe it was only 30 or 45 minutes, but it felt like hours. Just me, alone, a bedless room, items from the birthing process just strewn across the floor, now appearing much more evidently as I sat in my newly acquired Tyvek suit that was slowly getting torn up by my protruding back brace. Finally the nurse came back in and hurriedly rushed me out of the room. I had never been conscious going into an operating room before. I guess in my head I was expecting some type of clean room prior to entering. So when she opened up a large set of double doors to a blindingly bright, bone chillingly cold operating room, I was a bit taken back. Especially once I saw my wife laying on the table with two or three people standing around her already getting to work. In case you don't know, I don't do well with blood. So I kept my gaze as brief and took my spot at the head of the table, comfortably behind the sheet with the top quarter of my wife and the anesthesiologist. Everything besides the lighting and the attractiveness of the staff was pretty accurate to what you see on movies or TV shows. Lots of bags of fluid, screens with all sorts of graphics and numbers going across it, alarms beeping every few seconds or so, all while you can hear the people from the other side of the sheet mumbling through all their protective equipment. The anesthesiologist, who we had become quite comfortable with over the last day or so, leaned in and whispered to me that Alicia had asked not to see the baby and to not talk about anything medical related so as to not spike her anxiety. This was her first time being cut open. To both keep my own anxiety from spiking and just due to general curiosity, I started to inspect the room a bit closer. The lights, the walls, the people, just taking everything in. Back behind where I was sitting were two staff members standing next to a small baby sized table. One was a woman and the other one was a man. It was easy to see that this is where they would take the baby after removal to get it all cleaned up and ungunkified. Yeah. The woman was in standard OR attire. The man, however, looked normal below the neck, but above that looked like he was prepared to sweep the streets of a Seattle block party. Missing the helmet, of course, but full on respirator. The anesthesiologist informed us that he was the respiratory specialist and takes extra precaution when dealing with a COVID patient. Makes total sense when explained, but a bit terrifying to see in the corner of an operating room. One other thing that caught my eye was a small tower that consisted of four clear containers with blue tops. They slightly resembled a value pack of tall, cylindrical Tupperware containers with clear hoses going into it. About the time I notice them, I hear what can only be described as a wet vac hitting a patch of spilled chili. A second later, I realize that the vacuum sound that I'm hearing and the clear containers that I was examining are closely related. The clear hose quickly became filled with dark red blood and then gets violently splattered into the once clear container like the infamous vomit scene from Family Guy. Why didn't anybody tell me? <laughs> And that was enough looking around for me. I then start to focus 100% of my attention on my wife who is out of it. She was not only on a pallet full of anesthesia, but also a good assortment of IV meds to calm her down. She's rambling on about one of the ghetto Whataburgers near her house and is asking me to tell our anesthesiologist stories about our trips to said ghetto Whataburger. Basically anything to keep her mind with the fact that some surgeons are elbow deep in her uterus. Finally, the sound we had all been waiting for. The cry of a newborn bebe. Either way, a great progress for Bebe. But before we go on, I feel like it's important to step back an hour or so when we talked about Miss Bird not wanting to see or hold the baby until after cleanup. We had talked about it months before and we just didn't see the need to get covered in new baby goop. Plus, we've already talked about my stomach and blood. <laughs> But apparently that message didn't make it around the room because as soon as Colonel Respirator got his hands on her, he peeks around the corner and holds this pale, blood-covered flesh sack about a foot from us. To me, it was the most beautiful blood-covered flesh sack that I'd ever seen. But to Miss Bird, up there on cloud 732, she wanted nothing to do with that sack. For a very good reason that will be kept private. Sorry. The anesthesiologist quickly shooed him away to keep Miss Bird calm. The man then went to the cleaning station to start the process of ungrossifying our bebe. The bebe. 
The whole time, she was just screaming her head off, literally the worst moments of her life. I kept trying to sneak glances over my shoulder while also still holding the hand of Miss Bird, as the crying Bebe was not helping her stay calm. After about five minutes or so, the lady nurse from the cleanup station stuck our Bebe in what looked to me like a mechanics cart with a plexiglass box stuck on top. Turns out it was just a mobile incubator. She then told me it was time to go back to the room and let Mama finish getting sewed up. So I said my goodbyes and started walking down the same long hallway back to the room. After we'd gotten back to the room, the nurse explained that the incubator was just a precaution that they do with COVID patients, but it was perfectly okay for us to take her out and hold her as long as we washed our hands and wore a mask. And then she just like left the room. So it was just me and this tiny little human being that was just cut up my wife's stomach just sitting there. It was exciting and weird and terrifying all at the same time. Without friends or family there to celebrate with, I took the opportunity to start taking some pictures and inform people that both baby and mama made it out. I will forever remember these pictures. About 30 minutes had passed when they wheeled my drugged up wife back into the room, but she was in a much better mood this time. What's up, baby? Was the first thing that came out of her mouth when she saw me. Are you talking to me or that baby? I said. Is that my baby? She said excitedly. The nurse took little Luna over to mama for them to meet for the first time. Truly a magical experience. I was worried that the it's the best feeling in the world stories that you always hear parents tell were overrated. But let me tell you, it's not overrated. It's just impossible to put into words. So that is the story of the 55 hour labor, but wait, there's more. I won't go into as much detail about what happened after the birth, but this is one of those stories that just has to be heard. So strap in folks. Okay, so after Alicia gave birth, she started to have a fever. They said that was to be expected seeing as her water broke very early, plus with a major surgery, that an infection is also likely. But at the same time, they couldn't rule it out being COVID related. So they started her on antibiotics and told us to stay another night. This was Tuesday, so that put our release date for Wednesday. Thankfully, baby Luna was doing very well. Only thing of concern was that she was a bit jaundice. Basically a liver issue that causes the person to turn yellow. Very common and can almost always be cured with some UV therapy. So we started her on therapy, which essentially made her look like a tiny cholo in a tanning bed. Wednesday morning rolls around and Alicia's fever is gone, so they take her off the antibiotics. Her fever comes right back. Surprised the hell out of us because she felt fine. All things considered, of course. So they put her back on the antibiotics. Throughout the day Wednesday, she starts to develop a cough. Not fun when you've got a huge incision across your abdomen. So she decides to take a nap. When she wakes up, she said it's very hard to breathe. They check her oxygen and it's very low, like down in the 80s low. At this point, they were required to label her as a COVID patient with active symptoms. Changed from a COVID patient with no symptoms. No big deal, right? We already knew she was positive. Well, the issue is that the very nice hospital in the very nice part of town is not classified as a quote unquote COVID hospital. They let us deliver there because we weren't showing any symptoms. Plus, with an early labor like we had, it's one of those procedures that they couldn't turn away. But with us already having the baby, that rule no longer applies. So at around 7.30 p.m. on Thursday, they essentially tell her that she has to be transferred to a COVID unit at Methodist Metro, aka the shittiest hospital in town. But we didn't know that at the time. In fact, we were promised the world. Said there'd be a postpartum specialist there in the COVID unit to make sure she continues to receive her postpartum treatment alongside her COVID treatment. Well, that is not at all what happened. Thankfully, they discharged Luna and I since I had never ran a fever. Thankfully, my dad was able to come and help overnight Thursday night because my back was absolutely killing me because I had run out of painkillers on Tuesday and couldn't get a hold of any doctor until earlier in the day on Thursday. So around midnight, they transfer her to Methodist Metro. She did not receive any postpartum treatment. They didn't even give her any postpartum supplies. Not only that, they let her go without painkillers for 16 hours. During those 16 hours, she saw three different doctors who tried to diagnose her with all kinds of stuff except what was actually wrong. Then at the end of it, they basically say that she doesn't have bad enough COVID symptoms to be in a COVID unit and discharge her around 11 a.m. on Friday morning. 
But because she had transferred hospitals, now Methodist Metro, the shitty hospital, was responsible for prescribing her everything she needs for her at-home recovery, of which they prescribed nothing. So the poor girl had to spend six hours on the phone getting bounced around between both hospitals, her OBGYN, and her primary care physician. So to recap, she went 16 hours without painkillers, only two days post-surgery, got one dose, and then got sent home without any painkillers for another eight hours. I end up rounding up all the prescriptions around 7.30 p.m. on Friday. All the while, her cough is still really bad, which is making her incision hurt even more. Finally, she starts to get some relief, and we get to bed around midnight. Just three hours later, she wakes up gasping for air. She takes her oxygen level, and it's down to 85. We make the call to take her to the ER. We decided to take her to the one closest to our house, which is Methodist Northeast. Not as nice as the first one, but far better than Metro. They take her in and immediately admit her. To their credit, they got her in quick and ordered x-rays and a CT scan to look at her lungs. All the while, I'm in the parking lot, since I can't go into the hospital, changing my five-day-old baby's diaper on the tailgate of my truck. When they get the x-rays back, they determine that she has pneumonia in both lungs. But we run into the same issue we ran into at the NICE hospital, which is that they are not a designated COVID hospital, so she has to be transferred to either Metro or Medical Center both of which have zero beds available due to them taking in El Paso overflow patients. She of course refuses to go back to Metro, so they said they have to wait for something to open up at Medical Center. This was at about 5 a.m. Saturday morning. They said while she waits, all they were authorized to do is to give her oxygen. At 6 p.m., 11 hours later, they inform her that since she came in, they had received six more COVID patients, so the hospital director has made the call to open up a COVID unit there at Northeast. Great news because she didn't have to be transferred, bad news because that's 13 hours wasted where she could have been getting treated. So they moved her to the COVID unit around 9 p.m. and started steroids and antibiotics. She ended up spending four more days in that hospital before her symptoms had subsided enough to be released. It took another week or so for her to be able to walk on her own and truly feel better, but she was home, which was the important part. So there you have it, folks. The story is so ridiculous that it couldn't have been made up. Far from the birth that we had in mind when we started trying almost two years ago. But this is one of those situations where the destination was more important than the journey. This got me thinking, though. What other crazy birthing stories exist out there? If you've got one, go ahead and leave it down there in the comment section below. And if you like this video, go ahead and hit that like button. If you haven't already, go ahead and punch that subscribe button. And as always, thanks for watching. I'll see you guys next time.